Hebrews chapter 12 in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 12, and this, this, I mean, every, every week when you're preaching through a whole book of the Bible, um, every week that, um, you know, you know, you want you want to uh, know what was said and talked about, and what we looked at the week before, because you know every, everything's flowing through a given book of the Bible. But th this is one of those weeks where, especially because for for the past two weeks in, in Hebrews chapter eleven, we we talked about what what general topic the the the, the faith and, and the testimony of that faith of of who. Of, of, of people of faith in the past, right? And the, these, these great heroes of faith of the past, their example and so forth. And then I ended last week's sermon basically by saying that chapter 12 then starts out that, starts out the first word is what? That therefore, because of all this stuff we talked about in two sermons about chapter 11, because of all this example of all these heroes of faith, therefore then... Well, and that therefore tells us that here, here's, here's the so what. Here, here's the so what for you and me. Therefore, let's read verses 1 and 2. In chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who's the great cloud of witnesses? The, 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 these heroes of the faith of the past, and, and they're surrounding us, basically their testimony. It's not that they are surrounding us, watching us like ancestors or something. It's the testimony, their testimony envelops us. And because of that testimony of what they have done, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So as we talked about last week, again, the witness or the testimony of those heroes of the faith of, of the past, of long ago, that leads to this conclusion here provided in these first two um, verses of chapter 12, beginning with, with, with the word, therefore, since the original Jewish audience, remember, original audience of Hebrew, the book of Hebrews was a group of Jewish people who had some association with Christianity, likely some saved, some not saved, uh, just, just like in pretty much any church audience at any given time, but that original audience, since that original Jewish audience had such a powerful witness of the people of the Old Testament that, that they were familiar with, as Jewish people being familiar with the, the Old Testament Scriptures, since they had such a powerful witness of those heroes, then they needed to what? They needed to live up to that example, those examples of great faith. They needed to be the new heroes of faith. They needed to have the faith of their spiritual fathers. Guess what? So do we. Same thing applies to us today. Since we have the powerful testimony of the heroes of faith of the past, then we need to live up to the faith that we claim. If, in fact, we claim such a faith. Because, again, obviously, there are always people sitting in churches that haven't actually claimed saving faith in Jesus Christ and committed their lives to Him. But if we do, then because of this testimony, these examples of the heroes of faith of, of long ago, and actually of still today, that I held up the newsletter from Voice of the Martyrs, therefore then, since we have that, therefore then, we need to live up to that example. We need to become the heroes of faith of today. And I think the young lady and the old gentleman that I gave examples of are doing that. And the question is... Am I? Are you? That's the question. So the exhortation is, let us throw off everything that hinders, it says in that verse. Christians should get rid of anything and everything that restricts our spiritual life and growth. Now, you know, some things are not wrong in and of themselves. I've talked about this a lot. Some things that we can be involved with aren't in themselves wrong. But in the end, if they keep us from 
growing spiritually and doing the spiritual things that we should be doing, then we should throw them off, as, as this says. And actually the phrase, phrasing is very um, similar, akin to phrasing that was used of athletic performers in those days, that they would throw off anything that would tangle them up when they were running. And we need to throw off anything in our lives that would get tangled, tangled up in our spiritual life and keep us from doing the things spiritually that, that we should be doing. Christians must also put off every sin. It says in, here, in the, the verses we read, sin can cripple our ability to run a good Christian race. We need to run with perseverance, it says. We run not just a 40-yard a, a dash. We're running a what? A marathon. A lifetime of service to Jesus. And that takes perseverance. That takes sticking to it. The kind of sustained effort that the long distance runner has to have over the long course that they run, that's what the heroes of faith had in their spiritual race. It's what the original audience that this was written to was called upon to have. And by application since then, for every believer since then, including those of us who are here today, or those of you who are listening to this and watching this later, we are all called to the same thing. To run this race of life as a follower of Jesus to the end and with determination and perseverance. We are to run this race with our, with our eyes fixed on no thing and no one but Jesus. Jesus. Now, obviously, at times we obviously are going to have focus on family members and you know, work responsibilities and and friends and loved ones and so forth, that, that's, that's understood. But always rising above that, always being the priority is Jesus. And if, even if, if the things closest to us and even our work or anything else starts to rise above Jesus, uh-uh. That's, that's entangling sin because we are not to allow anything to have a higher priority than Jesus. And we need to cast it off. We need to get rid of it. Jesus went through the agony of the cross for the joy set before Him. And what, was the, what did we look at last week briefly at the end? The joy that was set before Jesus was what? Anybody remember? Some of you just watched the message last night, so you ought to remember. <laughs> Nobody remembers that one? The joy set, joy, Jesus suffered the agony of the cross for the joy set before Him, and that joy was the salvation of many souls that would be accomplished through His death and suffering on the cross. That was the joy set before Jesus. And Jesus scorned the shame of the cross. He gave no consideration to the shame of it. He endured it. He bore the burden and then after His resurrection and ascension back into the heavenly realm, having completed His work of redemption, He sat down where? Right the At the right hand of the throne of God. And as I discussed previously, probably several to multiple times in the book of Hebrews, actually He didn't sit down on a chair or anything. It, it's, it's figurative language in that, in that day, in that culture. Whoever sat at the right hand of the king, at the right hand of the throne of the king, had... Other than the king, the highest authority and power and, and honor in the kingdom. And so what this expression means about Jesus sitting down at the right hand of the Father is that once He accomplished the humiliation and the suffering and the agony that He went through, He had completed the act needed to redeem us from our sin, to pay for our sin, those of us who would come to Him in faith. And then He returned to the heavenly realm and resumed His position with God the Father with ultimate power and honor and authority. That's what that's saying. Verse 3. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. Who, who's that? Consider him. Who? Jesus. Jesus cons who we just talked about. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. So that, what? Who? You, you will not grow weary and lose heart. The, 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 the New Testament was, of course, originally written in a dialect of... Greek and the original Greek word in the original uh, manuscripts translated to English here. Consider when it says when it says there in verse three about consider him, consider Jesus. 
That word was often used in financial calculations in, in that Greek culture. And so we are, to, we, we are to calculate the great degree of humiliation and suffering that Jesus endured at the hands of those who opposed Him. And then what an example and testimony that should be to us. He en endured antagonism, hatred, hostility, and therefore He was in the same position that the original audience was in. Because what was the deal that the original audience was facing? They, they, they wanted them to what? Especially probably Jews were persecuting them to do what? Go back to Judaism. We still find ourselves in that kind of a position sometimes today, usually not rising to the level of the persecution of the two examples I gave earlier, or probably likely to the persecution that these folks were starting to face and would eventually face, but we can find ourselves in sim similar situations nonetheless, and it's going to get worse. The original audience was not called to suffer anything Jesus didn't endure, and neither are we. The original audience was urged not to give in. The original audience was urged not to give up. The original audience was urged not to get weak relative to their faith. Guess who else is urged the same things? All of us. The original audience was exhorted to persevere in the faith, in the face of hardship. And that's still true for us today. And boy, I sure again, I pray that we can see how, see how these, these urgings specifically applied to that original audience translate still so well over to us yet today. Have, have translated and applied to believers all through the almost 2,000 years since then and still are just the same today as I just gave you two examples of, right? Out of the voice of the martyrs. See, it's, it's foreign to us because we don't face that kind of stuff, but we still we face much milder stuff, and we, we wilt even under much milder persecution, even as little as getting made fun of, right? Well, here's an intro, quick intro to verses 4 through 11 next. Kind of a general heading, God's discipline of His children. Oh, another popular subject, right? Everybody, oh, can't wait. Yeah, let's do this. Let's talk about suffering. We all like that, right? Suffering comes to everyone. We know it's a part of life. We get it, right? We're not talking about being naive here. We get it. But knowing that it's a part of life doesn't make it easier, does it? However, I do believe that as with so many things in life, those with true faith in Jesus really can look at pain and sorrow in a different way than unbelievers. And not only can, but... Should, actually. Should, because many end up don't, not doing that. We can know that even when we don't understand the whys, and we always want to know why, right, relative to suffering, and I get it, me too. Even when we don't know the whys, though, we can still know that there's a very real meaning behind our suffering. Now, you've got to track with me here. This is just the intro, but please track with me. We can know that there's a very real meaning behind our suffering at any given time. We just read that Jesus endured His suffering on the cross for the joy, what? Set before Him, He endured His suffering because He knew what? He, he knew what it was going to accomplish. His suffering had meaning. Therefore, in the shadow of the cross, our suffering can actually be transformed. We can know that our suffering is not meaningless. No, we probably most often do not know. Like, Jesus knew what was going to be accomplished through His suffering. Oftentimes, we don't know the specific of what's going to be accomplished. But do you understand that we can know that God is going to accomplish something in it? Yes, you, you can know that by faith. You can take it to the bank. You, you won't know specifically what it's going to be, and you can't imagine, I can't imagine sometimes what possible good come, could come out of this, but I can believe still yet with faith that God's Word tells me that God will accomplish something good out of it and through it. And I believe it's many times not 
going to be me that sees the good, but that maybe others, somehow God will benefit others, just like these two examples I gave you, that they suffered. The good, God used that for good in the heart of somebody like me, as well as a bunch of other stories that I heard of what people have done. They never knew it, but God was using that in my heart. Still is. Using that in my heart. We must not miss the main point in these verses 4 through 11 here in Hebrews chapter 12. As children of God, believers are to see hardship and suffering as what? Discipline. Discipline from our Heavenly Father. We're going to read the verses shortly here. It's both discipline as a corrective punishment for sin when we sin against God. I'm going to talk about this more, so don't get your knickers in a twist yet. You know, aren't, we, aren't our sins taken as far as the, from the east as from the west from us? Yes, relative to our salvation, but we're still accountable because we still keep sinning even after Jesus, we accept Jesus' payment. We're still accountable. God still dis disciplines us and punishes us at times because of our sins. He also uses discipline as a form of teaching us and growing us in our faith. Again, there's a difference between being forgiven of our sins relative to our salvation and our, our sins as affecting our ongoing fellowship with God as we, as we go through this life. There's a, there's a difference. And that's why, relative to our salvation, we won't have to face the great white throne judgment that unbelievers will, but we will face... The beam of judgment, the judgment of believers, where we will be held to account for what we did with our salvation. For Christians, hardship and suffering are rightly understood only when seen as God's fatherly discipline correcting and directing us. Suffering isn't evidence that God doesn't love us. Listen to me. Suffering is not evidence that God doesn't love us, it's evidence that He does, he does love us. Believers are God's children and we are treated like His children. And this concept can get a little tough to grasp when we start talking about some of the worst kind of suffering that comes, comes our way in life. I, I, believe me, I get it. But we have to focus on the reasoning in the, in, the, in the line of thought. And then like always, our faith has to rise up when we can't completely understand what, how could it be in this situation. That's when it has to just be faith. And that's a part of it. I, I need to move on and wow is the clock running. Verse 4. So that's a summary. That was like an introductory summary of verses 4 through 11. Verse 4. In your struggle against sin, to the original audience, he was talking, has the Holy Spirit led him to write this? In, the, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. By, by the way, the Greek word in, uh, translated struggle here, the verb struggle against, it's and as I say, if I can say it, antagonismi, antagonize. It, it, it's where we get the English word antagonize. And yes, I am very antagonized by my efforts to resist sin. And I suspect some of you still are too, though I'm sure you are, are all holy and pure white. But I struggle, I am antagonized by my efforts to resist sin. And that's, that word antagonism I is translated here in the English struggle against. Struggle against. It referred originally to the struggle of that original Jewish audience that has been in view this whole book of Hebrews, which was what? Again, their struggle to sin was what? They, they were tending to want to do what? Go back to Judaism. Say, the, the, the heat's getting dirt, dirt turned up too much in this Christianity business. We'll, we'll go back. We'll practice Judaism. That would have been a sin. Would have been a sin because... After Jesus died on the cross and rose again and went back to heaven and it began this age that we're in now, whole new ball game, now the only way to God was through the Son, through the risen Son. And to fall prey to that temptation, that sin to go back and just walk away from the whole Christianity thing, that's what they were struggling against. They, they were having inclinations to want to do that. I think it's comparable to the temptation that we looked at in chapter 11, verse 25, when um, Moses resisted the, the temptation to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time and just 
stay associated with, with Egypt and the kingdom of Egypt and he in the, in the royal court and he could have had life, luxury, comfort and all that kind of stuff. And he, but that would have been sin because God told him to what? Lead his people out of there. I think this is, there, that's a parallel to what's being spoken of here. In the case of a resisting sin of turning away from Jesus, it was a very real possibility for, for these people in the original audience who were first facing persecution you know, to, to really face something that would have been bad. Jesus got killed, obviously. Many of the people honored in, in chapter 11 that we looked at, the previous two sermons, many of them obviously ended up being killed for their faith. But none in this original audience had lost their lives yet. And that's what he said to them here. None of you have like, shed your blood yet. But the exhortation was they needed to stay strong in their struggle against the temptation to walk away from Jesus in the midst of the persecutions that they had been under at that point. And even if they did eventually face the prospect of being killed for their faith in Jesus, they still needed to stay strong. Again, many of the heroes of faith have stood strong unto death in the past. The original audience was called to do the same. And guess what? So too are we. And none of us have faced getting killed yet, too. Uh, anybody here? No? No? Surely we can stand up then to the lesser persecutions. Verses 5 and 6. And have you, and have you completely forgotten that, that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when He rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He punishes everyone He accepts as a son. Jews in the original audience surely knew Proverbs 3, verses 11 through 12. That's what's quoted here that I just read in Hebrews. Maybe they were forgetting about that. When God speaks of discipline and rebuke, He is addressing who? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. He's, he's addressing believers. And He's going to go into an explanation of all this, of how, how we can relate to it in this way. He's addressing His children. It's interesting that the warning in here, it's, it's called the word of encouragement. <laughs> That this, that this idea of God disciplining us is to be a word of encouragement. Yay! Huh? Yeah? The certainty of suffering should encourage us, not discourage us. Still working on that one. Because we can know that God causes or allows suffering as discipline for His children. And again, I said earlier, this word discipline, it combines the thoughts of discipline as corrective action, corrective punishment, but also as various forms of teaching, like helping us grow in our faith. Do you ever get the feeling, I've grown enough, God. Okay, that'll do. That's enough. I've grown enough. Let, let, let me go for a while here. There's purpose and meaning from God in the suffering of a believer. I don't, I don't mean to make light of any of this. There's purpose and meaning from God in the suffering of a believer and we shouldn't belittle the significance of our suffering. We shouldn't fail to recognize or accept that they're from God. We shouldn't lose heart. We shouldn't become discouraged. We shouldn't feel hopeless in the face of God's correction. God disciplines His children that He loves, not, his, not unbelievers who are not His children, according to the Scripture. When believers suffer, they're actually experiencing a sign of God's love for them as the Scripture quote referred to. God disciplines and punishes, notice it says, all, everyone who is His child. So if you have saving faith in Jesus, you're going to be disciplined by God at some time or another. Verses 7 and 8. Endure hardship as... Endure hardship in life. Endure suffering in life as discipline from God. God is treating you as uh, His children, for what child is not disciplined by His Father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children, and not true sons and daughters. 
This is a follow-up then. And ba basically, uh, hopefully you can, you can see what the thing is. God's treating you as, as children. It was unthinkable in those days that any good father would not properly discipline, discipline his children. Now, these days we have different ideas about that, and I'll be careful not to trample on toes too much, but um, I, I will say, don't use that silly silliness that the way we sometimes look at disciplining our children today, cloud your understanding of what this is talking about. Because this is in a culture where it was a given, good fathers discipline their children. And so what he's, the point that he's making is, if, if you're not disciplined, then you're not his child because fathers don't discipline other kids, other um, parents' kids, right? They, they discipline their own kids. And so if, the point that he's making here in this scripture is if you're not, you know, if you're not going to get disciplined from God, then you're not his kid because fathers only discipline their own kids. And if you're his kid, which you only are if you have saving faith in Jesus, then you're going to get disciplined. You, you follow the line of reasoning? Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Proverbs 13, 24, by the way. The freedom from being disciplined is not a good thing. If you're, if you're not disciplined, then that means you're not God's child. Verses 9 through 11. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The analogy of the practice and the result of discipline ex uh, exercised in a human family concludes in these verses. Again, the understanding and the assumption is that all of those in the original audience had been disciplined as children. They had earthly fathers they get, who gave them discipline to punish them, to correct them, to train their behavior and attitudes. And the, and the ultimate effect of such proper discipline is that it eventually brought about respect, not resentment. And that's the way it should work. How much more then should believers submit to discipline from our Heavenly Father? Looking ahead to the future glory of the eternal life we're promised. Surely we understand the infinite distant difference between our earthly Father's discipline and that of our Heavenly Father. Good children respect the discipline of their earthly fathers. And that only lasts for the comparatively short days of, of childhood. And at times, that discipline's imperfect because all earthly fathers make mistakes. But our Heavenly Father's discipline is always perfect. And it's always perfectly for our good. And God's discipline is intended to develop us so that we may share in His what? In His holiness. So that we may share in God's holy character, the aim of God's discipline, of His people, of His kids is to produce in us a character that is like His. This gets into this, this thing, uh, you know, again, of how, uh, we are to be holy because God is holy. We, we are actually, he, he is striving for us to be like Him, but He's perfect, right? Are we ever going to be perfectly holy? No. no. We, I know we've gone through this a lot, but we have to keep hitting on it. This stuff keeps coming up. The aim of God's discipline is to drive us to be more and more like Him, more perfectly holy like Him, more so as time goes by. The, the fact that we're never going to get there doesn't mean we don't try, right? 2 Corinthians 13.11, we're supposed to aim for perfection, right? The whole illustration about me shooting the 22s and I'm aiming for what? At the, at the, at the target shooting contest, I'm aiming for what? The bullseye, right? I'm, I'm to aim for perfection. And some guys, once in a while, get a perfect score. Usually that doesn't happen. Never happened for me. But I, I try for it, right? And I've said before, if, if the bullseye is back there by Joe, I'm not going to be aiming over here somewhere, right? I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to hit the bullseye. 
I'm aiming to shoot a perfect round every time, right? That's the whole deal with us in our Christian walk. No, we're not going to be perfect. But I hear too many people say, oh, God knows I'm not perfect. Yeah, He knows, but He doesn't expect you to just not even try. In fact, He wants you to try. He's trying to conform you into His image, into the image of God the Son. We are to aim for perfection. He knows we're not going to get it, but we're to strive for it. We're to try to get it. Like I try to hit the bullseye every time I shoot. Even though I know I'm not going to. Again, at the time discipline takes place, it's usually not a happy thing, right? Discipline hurts. Sorrow goes along with it. But it produces something good out the other end, eventually. We are trained by the discipline of suffering. Especially the discipline of suffering at the hand of our Heavenly Father. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. This is very figurative language. I'm, I'm going to give you my, my quick as I can statement about it because the clock keeps on a ticking. Here's another therefore because of everything we talked about so far in the sermon. Now we have another therefore in verse 12 here. Therefore, because all that's been stated and explained about God's loving discipline... Therefore, the original audience was strongly urged to believe and live accordingly. To put the knowledge they had gained into effect. To run the spiritual race the way God wanted them to run the spiritual race. And once again, guess what? Same thing for us. We have heard. I heard first as I prepared this. You heard it now. Now, oh you can do is one of two things. Tell God no, or tell God okay. I'll aim for it. Right? You know. You've heard. <laughs> I've heard. What are we going to do? The spiritual race then should be run as a strong spiritual athlete, not a crippled spiritual athlete. I'm, I'm sort of giving you a meaning from this somewhat. Uh, the, the, these two verses are, are very figurative. True believers must run of strong spiritual athletes and, and, and we run to also make a path for other runners who are kind of lame athletes. who Other runners who they are not running as strong spiritually as we are. Rhoda's back there running that spiritual marathon, man. She's trucking it. It's okay, so she's doing it, but she's also supposed to be making a path, setting, setting an example for here, here I come. You know, I'm, I'm dragging my foot. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to run this marathon. I can hardly make it. But she's supposed to be showing me the way. She's making the path for me. And oh, this this opens up that whole other thing. You mean I not only have to do it for myself? I'm supposed to I'm supposed to like help other people and give them be an example. I don't want to be an example to nobody. Too bad. <laughs> You're supposed to be. God says you are supposed to be an example. I am supposed to be an example. To others, so that they can then learn to run strongly, be that strong, run that strong spiritual race, instead of being a spiritual cripple. You know, dragging along home. My, my leg hurts me. My back hurts. Oh, my lungs are burning. I can't do it. I don't know where I'm at in my notes. <laughs> Verse fourteen. Make every effort to live in peace. With all people and to be, there it is again, to be what? Holy. To be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Gee, whizzickers. The strong urgings continue. The New Testament contains a, a number of these exhortations to believers to be, first of all, to be at peace with fellow believers and also with people in general. Pe people are generally at peace with each other, right? People are very often selfish, self-centered, abrasive, harsh, confrontational, disagreeable, argumentative, hostile, quick to anger, quick to fight, divisive, confrontational, and, and vengeful. But that's not the way God calls for us as believers, as followers of Jesus to be. The Bible clearly calls for us to make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Many times I've stressed Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, what? Live at peace with everyone. Now, again, we understand 
Just when it says, if it is possible, that means sometimes what? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just can't live at peace with somebody. And again, one of those times would be if somebody's coming up to cold cock me, um, they're, they're not intending for me to live at peace with them anyway, and guess what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to cold cock them before they get to me. You know? That's not what this is talking about. That's a whole sermon for another day, that whole topic. But that's not what this is about. But don't misunderstand the main point, what it is about. This is about that as Christians, we do need to make every effort to be peaceful with others. We should not be instigators. We should not be harsh with others. We should not engage in the name-calling that is so prevalent today, especially on social media. We should not respond to hate with hate of our own, right? And again, that's not self-defense. But there are many times that we say and do hateful things that we're not, we're not trying to defend ourselves against an attack or something. We are not to respond with hate to hate that we receive. We should, not receive, we should not seek revenge. If we are doing these kinds of things, there is no way we can even pretend to believe that we are doing everything we can to live at peace with others. No, no way. The Bible even says believers are called at times to allow ourselves to be wronged by fellow believers. Literally, like, no question, they were wrong. They, they caused me you know, harm in some way, but rather than take them to court, I just let it go. R read 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 6. That's another subject for another day as well. We are called to live in holiness. Holiness means being set apart to God. Holiness means being recognizably different than everybody else around us. The majority of the people in the world are not believers, true believers in Jesus Christ. We are to be visibly different than what they are. Holiness means that we live in a way that is very different than the way most of the people around us live. Holiness means others should see God in us. Wow! Certainly unbelievers do not live in holiness, right? Unbelievers aren't going to see the Lord in fellowship while they're, earth, while they're on the earth. They're, they're not going to see the Lord in, in, in the glory of heavens. The only way they're going to see the Lord one day is whenever they're bowed down on a knee, finally confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it'll, it'll be too late because it'll be where? At the great white throne judgment, after which they'll end up in the lake of fire. Believers should live in holiness. And again, a million times I've talked about it, this is not being holy so we can get to heaven. It's being holy, what? Because we've already been given heaven through Jesus Christ and His work on the cross, if, if we've accepted that. Verse 15, heading down the home stretch, honest. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it, it says. Now, another big, if you don't get anything else, get this one out of it. It says, see to it. See, see to it that, what? Who? That no one misses the grace of God. What's that mean? If I'm going to see to it that, that Barb gets a new scarf, I, I'm going to, What? I'm going to ensure that Barb gets a new scarf. That, that means I'm going to see to it myself that that happens for her. This says we are to see to these things. As believers, we are to see to this stuff for others. That means all y'all, not, not just me, the preacher. That means all of us with saving faith in Jesus are to see to it, verse 15 says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Okay, so what's that? What, what are, what are y'all supposed to do here along with me? It speaks to the thought that folks in the church must look out for other folks in the church. Believers must look out for other believers. It parallels what we talked about in verses 12 and 13 about, remember the, the marathon illustration, you not only run the marathon yourself, but you're making a path and showing the way for others. This parallels that thought. This is talking about people in the pews. There's different opinions about the meaning of what we are to see too. I'll give you, I see two major, major divisions. I'll give, you, I'll give you both of them because I think both of them could fit and are, and are good fits. 
Some believe that missing God's grace refers uh, to not grasping the grace and love of Jesus in the, uh, and of God in the midst of God's discipline that we spoke of earlier. In other words, you're suffering and you just aren't seeing the love of God in it. You're not seeing the grace of God in it knowing that He's, he's working to improve you and so you, you develop a bitterness because of it. And, and what happens when one person, often when one person gets bitter in a group like this? What happens often? What happens to that bitterness? It spreads. And it often happens in a church. And somebody's having their problems and they get bitter against God and they're talking to other people and pretty soon that bitterness spreads like a disease and causes problems and grumblings in the church. Other people think that this missing God's grace actually refers to missing the grace of salvation itself. In the original audience, it would have been referring to those who were involved with the church but actually weren't saved and they're, they're thinking, we're, we're just going back to Judaism. Like they're getting disillusioned. They're, they're like, they haven't actually come to Jesus in saving faith. They were there in church or there with these other Jews that were functioning within some realm of Christianity. Maybe because their girlfriend had them there or their mother wanted them to go or whatever. And they're there, but they never come to faith in Jesus. And it's like the heat's getting turned up and they're saying, I had enough of this. And they're telling other people, let's just go back. Let's just go back, back to being Jews and, you know, let's just get away from this stuff. And, and so their, their bitterness about what's happened to them, again, what happens to it when they start grumbling and whispering to other people in the, in the, in the group and saying, we don't need this stuff. It, Judaism was good enough for all those years. It ought to still be good. And pretty soon, now there's a whole bunch of poison again. The bitter root is spreading. And a lot of, and a lot of those people in that original audience were starting to want to go back. And it can be the same kind of thing that can happen today when people decide, no, they hung around Christians for a while, but nah, this is, I'm not in for this. i got a life to live and i got things to do. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it from people that were in here for periods of time and they disappear and I even spoke to relatives and then they said, well, they, they, got, they do this and they do that and they said, you know, they were just, they, they got too many things to do with these other activities that they're doing and they don't have time for this at this point in their lives. And, and when people like that start to talk to other people and say, look, you know, uh, you know, you don't need to spend all your life doing that stuff. You know, let's, let's enjoy the stuff here we can, while we can, and all that kind of stuff. And that bitter root spreads. I think it could be either one of those things. I think both interpretations have merit in this. And I think it would bode well for all of us as believers to avoid either one of those, those things. Last two verses, 16 and 17. See that no one... And, and again, depending, there's another translational issue here. Some Bibles say, see that no one is sexually immoral. Other translations just say, see that no one is immoral, just general immor immorality. Or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears even. And so, in this again, whether it, whether it should actually be sexually immoral or just immoral, then the other problem is, did that apply to Esau as the example? That Esau was either sexually immoral or just generally immoral, as well as being, what else did he say he was? Godless? That, that's the other question. Some think that the, this immorality, whatever it was, also was applying to him. Others think, no, that, that's just a separate category. Don't be sexually immoral or don't be immoral. And then don't be godless like Esau. Again, interpretations and, and translations of the original Greek word on, on both sides of the coin. I'm, I'm just I'm going give to you, give you my take on here. Whichever way it actually should be, there's no question about whether, you know, whether the immorality applies to Esau or whether only godlessness ap applies to Esau. Many New Testament passages tell us that we are to avoid sexual immorality, right? Many, many New Testament passages tell us that we are to avoid immorality in general. Without, without question. And New Testament passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that we are to ensure that others, we are to see to it, remember the wording that we started with here, we are to see to it that other people in our bodies of believers are not engaging in sexual immorality or general immorality. All that stuff is true. And so, whichever way exactly for sure it goes, actually the rest of the Bible supports all of it. And we should be part of it. And see, that nobody likes this. Well, you mean I'm going to talk to somebody else about their immorality? I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, what are they going to tell me? You're, judging me. You're just judging me. I'm not, I can't do that. Now, now, this is one of the many passages that says we are supposed to do that. 
We are supposed to question that in the church. We are supposed to bring that up in love with our brothers and sisters and say, man, you know what you're doing. You know God says that's, that's immoral. You shouldn't be doing that. that. Come on, man. You know, in that kind of way. Not, hey, you dumb butt, you know, what do you think you're doing, you know? You're going to hell! Right? It's not that. That's what people have in their mind. And that's not the way we handle it. We should be going up in love and saying, come on, man, you know... You know, you're, you know God says we're not supposed to do that. You know, you know God says we're not to live a lifestyle like that. You, you know God says, you know, drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, whatever, all, all those types of things. That, that's how we're supposed to approach each other. It's not just supposed to be me coming to you, which, which I will when I have to. I hate it, but I do it. But we're to do that. All, you all are to do that with each other too when necessary. But, but then, Jesus teaching about, you've got to make sure what? You've got, you got to make sure where you're at in your life. Don't be like the Pharisees who, who would go and tell people, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to go to hell, you know. But look at their own lives, and they were cheats and swindlers, and Jesus called them whitewashed tombs and a bunch of snakes, right? <clears throat> where was I? Well, if for the comparatively small and immediate gain of escaping persecution, people refused to accept Jesus in saving faith and went back to Judaism, they would barter away something of infinitely greater worth than temporary freedom from persecution. And this ties into the Esau example. You know, Esau, Esau bargained away his, his rights as first, firstborn child for what? For, he was so, he's starving and he wants a bowl of soup and he, he, he bargained and said, I'll give you my birthright if you just give, give me something to eat, basically. And he bartered away something, you know, he was temporarily very hungry, but he bartered away something much, much more valuable than that temporary thing he was dealing with. And the comparison here is to this original audience, you, you, you barter away an, an eternal... Now, this is something eternal. You barter away something eternal, eternal salvation, for in return not suffering some temporary persecution. You, you don't want to do that. Deal with the temporary. Don't, don't barter away the eternal for some temporary pleasures and comfort on earth. That's essentially what this is all about, wrapping it up in a nutshell. Let me sum all this up. As always, I'm, I'm over. Every week I think I'm going to be not, but I, every week I am. Number one, sum all this up today. First of all, as always, you need to have true saving faith in Jesus or you will not go to heaven. You will not pass go. You will go to the lake of fire. Number two, if you have that faith in Jesus, you need to keep your eye. You have to need to keep your eyes on Him. Can't let anything or anyone else Get in the way or take priority over Jesus in your life. Number three, hardships and sorrow in, the, in this life are discipline from our Heavenly Father. You say, well, how, how, you mean you're saying He's making those things happen to me? He's either making them happen to you or He's what? He's allowing them to happen to you. One way or the other, the sovereign God described in the Bible has the power to stop anything from happening. And so when that bad thing is happening to me, God, yes, is either causing it or He's at least allowing it because He can stop it. Now this gets tough when you start talking about some of the you know, suffering children and all that kind of stuff. I get it. And today's not the time to get into that. But that's the, that's the teaching we're dealing with here today in Hebrews 12. Hardship and sorrow in life, it says specifically, is discipline from God for a believer. You can take it to the bank and count on it. It is. It's happening to you because God wants it to be happening to you. Whether He's causing it or whether He's just allowing it, He's wanting it to happen to you and He's going to use it to either discipline your sin and try to get you to stop sinning or just as a general corrective measure or a growing measure to help you grow in your faith as you deal with suffering. Now, I would love to grow in my faith without suffering. Thank you. But guess when in my life I have grown the most in my faith? When I have been suffering. And that is the case with all of us. We tend not to grow in our faith nearly as much when things are great. And that's the reason I'm convinced that when we say why these things happen, these bad things, I think a lot of it is because otherwise none of us would grow very much. 
Because where we really grow is in our suffering. Number four, discipline, either corrective punishment for sin or training us to be, to be more like God. Th those things, again, are for a believer. Like when those things are happening, it is in the life of a believer because we are a child of God. He is our Heavenly Father and He is dealing with, with us in those ways. Number five, we need to strive to live a holy life in the sight of God. That's why He's working on us. That's why He's disciplining us. He's trying to make us like Him. He's conforming us more and more and more into the image of the Son, God the Son, Jesus Christ. And number six, when the storms of suffering and sorrow hit, hang on to the Lord. Hang on to the Lord with all you got. Put yourself around fellow believers. They'll help you hang on. Hang on yourself. Hang on until the storm passes by. And that's the closing hymn. Amazingly, that I tied in somehow. Uh, as the storm passes by, it's the closing hymn, number 543. Thanks for your patience this morning again. Stand as we sing 543.